this is wrong. Everybody knows this is wrong. It's damaging the integrity of his office. So why doesn't he just stop doing it? All right. What's the issue? It's all about fundraising and access. Are the Liberals bending the ethics rules when they charge wealthy donors up to $1,500 to meet cabinet ministers at party functions? The opposition calls it pay to play. Let's see how that flies at the table tonight. Andrew and Chantel, joined by Huff Post, Ottawa Bureau Chief Althea Raj. Andrew, bad thing, good thing, is this a problem? <laughs> uh, it is a, a problem, certainly in principle, and I think uh, maybe they've crossed a few lines here. Uh, the, the narrower the group that you're meeting with, the more private it is, uh, the more that it's advertised as, oh, you get to bend the ear of so-and-so, the more that you're charging for it, the more that it and unseemly it looks. Now, at $1,500, it isn't as bad as the situation we had in Ontario, which we seem to be extricating ourselves of, where people were paying tens of thousands. But it's $1,500 is a lot more than most people could afford, and you're essentially giving people very unequal access uh, to cabinet ministers. And on, on principle, I see no reason why we shouldn't do away with it. But 1500 is the limit, That's so right. it's legal. It's legal. Right. Chantal? You're actually uh, selling exclusivity. Uh, that's as exclusive as it can get under the federal system. It does not breach the law. It's been done by others. It does seem to fly counter to the instructions that the prime minister himself put in those mandate letters to his own ministers, where it said not only to not uh, be seen to be giving exclusive access to lobbyists, especially for money, but uh, the appearance of it was also something that he guarded against. Well, the appearance of it uh, is there for most Canadians to, to see. Yeah, and they are using the Prime Minister's words against him on this. Althea, where do you stand on it? I really don't think it's as bad as people seem to suggest it is. First of all, the rules in Canada are pretty strict. Um, could they be better? Absolutely. Uh, the wording in the conflict of interest uh, act says that you, the minister, cannot personally solicit funds from a stakeholder or a lobbyist. So perhaps getting rid of the word personally, I mean, if you're at a fundraiser, you may not be asking for people for money directly, but somebody asked for money on your behalf, um, sold you being there. Um, I think as long as they advertise these publicly on the internet and technically anybody who wants to go can go and the guest list is released publicly so we can track if there actually is a conflict. So if you're, for example, Karen Shepard, the lobbyist commissioner, is actually investigating one case where it seems like there was a breach of the rules. Apotex, uh, generic drug manufacturer, the chairman of one of the meetings uh, the finance minister was at, his, his firm has lobbied the finance department three times at least. That looks like it's a conflict. So, you know, when there is a direct case and you can say this was a problem, but so far that's the only thing we've re we're really looking at. I disagree that almost everyone who is a corporation is actually interested in lobbying the finance minister for some reason or yes. other. Uh, it's not Apotex versus someone else. For one, two, I live in a province that prided itself on having the most strict fundraising system in Canada, and on paper it was certainly true. Today, the Quebec Liberal Party gave back half a million dollars to uh, Elections Quebec in illegal contributions. So there are many ways to get around a system that looks strict, and these not so widely advertised, not so widely reported on who was there events uh, certainly breach the spirit, if not the letter of those rules. The language of, of every ethics code that you've ever written is you can't just do the bare minimum. You have to behave in a way that stands the closest scrutiny and merely obeying the law isn't enough. Uh, yeah, anybody can go who's got $1,500 to spend. So it's not or really... $500. Yeah, it's not really whatever. anybody who can go. Uh, I think the root of this is, and when you, when you start to talk about this, people say, well, how on earth are the parties going to be able to finance themselves? As if there were some sort of fixed amount of money that the parties have to spend. And I think ultimately the root of this is parties don't need to spend anything like what they're spending now. The only reason any of them spend as much as they do is because they know the other ones are going to spend that much, and it becomes a kind of an arms race. But there's no sort of independent necessity of it, and nothing would be lost. This is, I guess, my point, point is nothing would be lost if you prohibited cabinet ministers from going to these meetings. There's no downside to this, there's only upside. No, it's kind of ironic in a way, because all this is taking part, place in a city that's full of lobbyists yes. and consultants who get tens of thousands of dollars and more Which from some of these same companies to do exactly the same thing. A hundred percent, and this is another form of unequal access. If you've got money to, to be able to afford a lobbyist, you will have a much better hearing in Ottawa than if you don't. And that's a problem we should be dealing with as well. I don't know that to be true. 
Do you? I mean, I, I don't. Some student Why groups don't. Why the for them? Well, some people find it beneficial for them to have a lobbyist, but I don't know, yeah. like, the, the students seem to do pretty well with this government without having lobbyists. Fair enough. But some of those lobbyists aren't dealing with ministers. They're dealing with bureaucrats, right? Of course. To try and Yes. And there's a whole the bunch of other activities process. happening yeah. around Ottawa that have nothing to do with party fundraisers. You're hobnobbing at some gala event or you're yeah. somewhere if, else. If you're and just an average citizen in Medicine Hat, you do not have the same kind of access as either a lobbyist or an organized interest group. But Did I the Conservatives I, do anything differently? No. And that's they, they what, just, exactly uh, that's yeah, what and Justin Trudeau is using as his defense. Uh, I think we should... Except, as you point separate. out, he put in new rules. Yes. Yes, but that's the thing. One, I don't think you should take lobbying into this discussion, which is about fundraising. Second, I think the question everyone should ask is, if I were just me and not me minister, would someone really be paying $1,500 to have a drink with me? The, the, answer, if the answer is uh, <laughs> yes, possibly you're very popular for reasons unknown. But if the answer is no, maybe you shouldn't be there. But at the end of the day, it was Justin Trudeau who sent those letters and prided himself on making them public. And what they say, unless he didn't mean it, means these things should not be happening. All right, moving on. Um, Justin Trudeau uh, met with uh, a bunch of young people and, and others at a, a Canadian Labour Congress event the other day in Ottawa. And it turned into a really interesting back and forth with, with, with some of these young people because we haven't seen this really happen with Justin Trudeau ever since he won election where it's been more selfies than protests. Watch this. Uh, absolutely. I intend to keep all my promises. I will tell you uh, that it is a little bit frustrating for me to come in, sit down, look forward to hearing from you, talking with you, and seeing a room full of people who are standing in a way that shows they're not listening to me. What are you going to do about our country? What about Ontario? I'm from Ontario. I'm sure there's lots okay, okay. of people here from Ontario. One, one, pick one question, sir. Okay. We're here to talk about wages a lot throughout this, this uh, thing. What's wages matter if the cost of living keeps going up? Hydro in Ontario has gone up 300% since 2007. Okay, okay, was that your, what, 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 what matters the cost of living if wages keep going up? I'm allowed to talk. Yes, you are. Just ask me a question, sir. Yes. I have a right to talk. Please don't cut me off. I'm sorry I cut you off, but this is our thing, not yours. Okay, this is on your thing. Okay, this is your thing. Okay, this is your thing. Thank you uh, for your openness to actually hearing my answers. Uh, thank you for challenging me. All right, that's just uh, the highlights of what was an interesting little session. But when you look at it and you recognize that he's probably going to face a lot more of this. Some of that was on, on pipelines. It could well be more depending on what their decision is. Um, what do you make of that and how he dealt with it? Uh, this is where he's at his best, I have to say. He, he is, uh, and I've said this many times, he has this bottomless reservoir of self-assurance that sometimes gets him into trouble, sometimes come, comes across as arrogance, but at many times it shows an, he's able to show an openness and a graciousness and a little bit of combativeness, but I don't think in a way that, people, that got people's backs up too much. But generally speaking, he's been willing to, to expose himself to this kind of thing. Uh, and it, it gives him credit he can draw on. So even as people were maybe attacking him there, there was also a... Uh, I think in, in most of the room a feeling of, well, at least he came to listen to us. And not every politician is willing to do that. The question is going to be, as this ramps up, and inevitably he's going to face more of this, as any government will, is he going to be able to maintain that uh, openness that he's, that's been such an asset for him until now? I'll see you. Um, I think that the Prime Minister, I agree with you, this sort of, he comes across as being very confident, very... Um, yeah, very confident in, in the way he approaches the protesters. But what is really nice, I think, about having a political leader is he's not afraid of going into a hostile room. And we saw him engage with protesters on C-51, for example, in the lead up to last year's election campaign. Uh, it's not true that he has kept all his promises, especially to that group of young people. And it's pretty clear that the electoral coalition that he built in 2015 is not going to be there for him in 2019. Because even if he might have kept the, the letter of his promise, a lot of people projected certain aspirations on him. They thought, for example, on indigenous issues that maybe they were going to get a veto with all of his promises from building a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Uh, that looks like the relationship with indigenous communities seems to be souring. With young people, we saw there, more of this is obviously going to come when the government has to start, start making decisions. Sean, 
I'm not convinced that uh, I equate protesters with the electoral coalition that Justin Trudeau built. Uh, I think they may be two different things. And uh, at the end of the day, when people vote, they vote for the least bad choice on offer. So it remains to be seen where that vote will go. The only reason these confrontations are happening is because Justin Trudeau goes in places where uh, Stephen Harper and Jean Chrétien, after he taught all the demonstrators, stopped going. Those uh, were the days, right? Those were the days. <laughs> and if, he ever com if ever comes to that, and mm. Justin Trudeau is really tired and things are not working out as well for him as they have been, which was Chrétien's case just after the referendum, it might end. So for, on that basis, I don't think he loses. I've never seen a prime minister lose from taking on people and trying to have a conversation with demonstrators. But there will be a line at some point, and a lot of people are going to be showing up to get publicity for their cause and not to have a conversation with the prime minister. But, and so it's going to be a difficult balance to keep. But there's a lesson, I think, for other politicians is, is it's on balance, it's worth the risk. If you have any political instincts at all, not all of them do, but if you've got reasonably good politi political instincts, it's worth it getting out there, letting people take a shot at you. I don't mean a literal shot, but a, but a uh, you know shout at you and and, and that sort of thing. Um, it, it only makes you look more open and more magnanimous. All right, we've got time for one, uh, just a quick hit from a couple of you on uh, the new Senate list. We saw it in the news. Here it is again. These are your nine uh, new senators going into the uh, uh, into the House uh, of the Senate, and these were all. What's interesting about this group is all of them applied for the job. As we heard, 2,700 or so applied for the job. Um, Althea, thoughts on this grouping? They're an interesting and impressive bunch of people. Uh, they're supposed to be nonpartisan, and it's very clear that there is nobody in there that is, you know, a party bagman. But they're all people who represent things that the Liberal Party stands for, closer relationships with Asia. Uh, the equality of men and women, uh, single parents issues, arts, you know. so. It's still, it's still a political appointment, even though it's not a partisan appointment. Andrew. The, the, the notion that this is independent is certainly one of the greater uh, uh, cons the Liberals have been able to pull off. It's not just that they represent Liberal issues. In many cases, they represent li client groups, Liberal constituencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so think they are, I mean, they said they all applied. Yeah, you think well, they were encouraged to apply? Frankly, the, 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 if it were me, the, the fact that somebody who applied to be a senator would be an instant disqualification. But, uh, <laughs> but somebody from like the Fraser Institute there's or... No, there's nobody from wide swaths of Canadian society, well, shall we say. You know, perhaps nobody from the Fraser Institute applied. Yeah, well, perhaps, no, it's, you know, I mean, we, we don't but, know but that. But there are no clear people who are not from a big L liberal I, I, Yeah, group. I can't imagine more than one of those people has ever voted conservative in their life. Uh, but fine, they, they are impressive people, that's fine, but, but if we're talking about diversity, there's a diversity in some dimensions there in terms of genetics, there's not so much diversity in terms of people's outlook and attitude. I understand they're holding on to your application. Though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just your better. Names are still I'm to just come. better, that's right. <laughs> thank you all, and thanks, Althea, for joining us.